and salutations, everybody. Welcome back to yet another episode of the Snart Fangle Podcast. I am your host, Jake Metzger, along with someone who doesn't take no for an answer when he's talking to squirrels telepathically. They don't belong on the dang property. David Reed. David, how are you doing this fine evening? I'm doing or morning, quite well. Morning, wherever. Quite well. Whoever's listening to this out there. Okay, just very well. Nothing more, nothing less. I mean, there's always something to complain about, but eh, is it worth it? You know? <laughs> and who will listen? And who will listen? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And for our third chair today, we have someone who requires David's zoolingualism for the benefits of autism go deeper than one may even realize, especially this time of year when our guest is fighting the onslaught of gophers around his property. Can David assist our favorite ADHD pastor with the great gopher rebellion of 2024? Well, with God, all things are possible. Ladies and gentlemen, Thaddeus Metzger. All the gophers will die. Yes. 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 I- I'm doing great. I'd like to say, before we get started, um, okay. it was an honor to get an invitation to the award ceremony last night to the uh, Best Podcast Award of 2023. And, uh, Hosted by Snar- Andrew Schultz. Yeah. yeah. Snar- Snarfangles took swept the floor. All five awards <laughs> went to There's Snarfangle. Five? And, by the way, thanks for the invite to the front row. That was nice. And uh, <laughs> while David was giving his accepted speech, I looked over at Ben Affleck, and a tear was welling up in his eye. <laughs> so, David, well done. You got old Benny to cry. Wow. Well done, bud. Does it, it's not that hard for him to cry, but man, you <laughs> no, know. I haven't, seen, I haven't seen that since uh, Goodwill Hunting. So, <laughs> well done. I haven't seen it since the behind the scenes of Justice League. You was know, he so. in Goodwill Hunting? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah just yeah, making sure it's yeah, right. You yeah. got it. You got okay. the right one. Okay. You got the right one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was interesting that night. I mean, you had. Ben Affleck, Andrew Schultz was hosting. Yeah, yeah. Joe Rogan was a no show. He's like, this isn't for yeah, me. Yeah, you know, he was busy. Me. He was nominated he was for everything, busy. though. Okay. So. You guys beat him. Well yeah, done. we beat him. What was the Snart minor leagues? What was the minor leagues? You We're know? taking it in a new level. Yeah, I'm proud of you guys. Super oh, proud yeah. of you guys. Well done. Well done, Snark. <laughs> yeah, Snark. yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, when, when, you, when you talk about awards and you talk about people uh, hosting them, it's, uh, or I should say fictional awards, you know, it kind of talks about lies that oh yeah well, well good, no this might have been true good segue i mean Jake. i mean talk about the ba- the bombs we've received in the mail <sighs> yeah. well no they're not bombs they were just smoking packages well let's just say the hate mail you let's know? just say this this episode is probably going to receive some hate mail oh. um so be prepared you know <laughs> smell your packages before you open them. <laughs> <laughs> anyway uh so the topic today guys let's jump into it um, what do we got that <clears throat> well i want to talk a little bit about the power of a lie so I, I, you know, I'm doing a new sermon series on lie versus truth and been digging into God's word and, and getting inspired, looking at our culture. And so this is a, a conversation I want to bring to the snart fangle and get your guys' opinion on it, because uh, to be honest, it's the best way to learn is to do a podcast, obviously, or listen to one. And so I, I want to kind of hit the idea of deception in culture. Okay? Mm. Deception. Now, if you if you paid attention in the news the last you know, four or five years, uh, you know, I, I used to believe everything I saw on the news was truth. Okay. If Walter Cronkite said it, it must be true. Right. Mm. If there was a, a, a news affiliate or somebody who's a journalist who did the due diligence to investigate, you would think it would be legitimate. And I've learned in the last five years, that's not always the case. And in fact, the opposite is true where there can be a half truth, a partial truth, leading to the based in a lie. And so we need to be aware of this. We need to be attentive and looking for these things. And so I guess I, I want to start the conversation with the definitions. So let's define the word deception. Okay, culturally, context speaking, what does deception mean to you? David, let's start with you. Mm. So when I hear the word deception, I would say it, brings to my mind the picture of someone who is operating in a lie as though it were the truth. Mm. Interesting. So operating in the lie as though it is the truth. Okay, that's good. Jake, how about you? So you're talking about like culturally or just the concept of well, deception or the definition of it? It starts, it, to be honest, it starts in our hearts. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But there's influences, Mm -hmm. right? The Ephesians 6, uh, 11 says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. The Apostle Paul says, but we wrestle against principalities and powers. That's right. And the rulers in the darkness of this age. Mm -hmm. So there is a spiritual aspect 
to the motivation of a lie and the spread of a lie and those that pro- profitize it, right? Um, the nature of false prophecy, in my opinion, mm. is <laughs> pitching falsely a lie. And, and, you know, you go into Revelation, the idea of false prophecy and what that means in the end times. It goes deep. Anyway, so you can apply it to culture. I, my, I, my first question, I guess, is rooted in the idea of, like, <clears throat> the Kennedy files were never released. Obviously, yep. something's going on there. Mm. You have COVID-19 stuff. Mm. You have Epstein Island. You got all these things that culture said wasn't true. And yet, in the last five years, we have truth coming out saying they, they actually happened. So they were called conspiracy theorists at one time. Now they're called facts. So my question is, deception. How would you define it? Man, it's, I mean, obviously deception would be lies. I kind of like what they were saying. Lies portrayed as truth is what I would say deception is. Right. Or the belief of the lie as the truth. Mm. Or the, what your heart, because the heart can be deceived. Mm. And... What I, what that brings to mind to me is, and we're talking about all the the cultural stuff, the political right, right, stuff, right, the right. stuff that's happening in our modern day, especially right. in the year twenty twenty four. I think I've mentioned this on the show before, but yeah, during like when this year was heading off to a start, it felt different to me. And I was mm-hmm. talking to a friend of this uh, about this the other day, where we were talking about, it and I'm like, "Does it feel like another year?" And they're like, "Yeah, yeah, but doesn't feel the same. It's right. or it doesn't feel." It feels different in a way. Mm. And when the heart is paying attention to things around them or maybe trying to get deeper spiritually, mm-hmm. there are more things revealed, I would say. But I'm not saying I'm like the all-knowing one or whatever. Right. But you can sense different things out. And that's a good way of sniffing out the deception. Mm. And I think we've you've brought up great examples, but I would also point out stuff like the Cat Williams interview. Mm-hmm. From Shay Shay, mm-hmm. that podcast. I watched the whole thing. It was like four hours long. Mm. And I don't know anything about Cat Williams. I knew he was a comedian. He sounded funny. And what do you, what do you, what do you mean I sound funny? Now I'm joking. Uh, it, but the point of it is, it, man, you guys didn't laugh at the Goodfellas. I, I, don't, know. I, I don't know, man. I'm not educated. What do you mean I'm Apparently. funny? What do you, what do you yeah. mean by that? Anyway. anyway. I'll take your word we'll, for we'll it. We'll renege Joe Pesci later, <laughs> Thad. But, ha, 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 ha. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. but the point of it is... It's what he said in the interview really spoke to me where he said uh, stuff will be revealed like the truth mm. is is coming and then like no time later the P. Diddy stuff was revealed so he probably caught wind of that earlier yeah and, and everybody is from what it seemed it seems like a lot of people knew about what he was doing and stuff like that in Hollywood same as with, with the Weinstein stuff like everybody mm. knew it was the biggest or not the biggest kids it was the most well known secret in town that kind of thing and I'm just wondering what else is out there Mm. but back to where we are it's interesting how things are coming to the light and coming into view for what they truly are and it's not just a deceiving of the heart for people who are believing or wanting to believe something but it's also the light is revealing things in the heart as well and i don't really know where to go from here but what i will say just as a last note is to guard your heart and be very careful and ask questions, um, especially in the time we live in today. And I mean, I remember listening, speaking of podcasts, I was listening to that Tucker Carlson interview that Joe Rogan had, and he brought up a ton of different things. But one of those was like, um, I think it was, it was, uh, I think it was Trump commenting on the Kennedy files as well as like Watergate and stuff like that. And, right. And when like the Kennedy and files and everything. And I think he said a quote, Trump did, where he's like, if you knew what was in there, yeah. like I do, it, you wouldn't want you it wouldn't, to be released yeah, either. You wouldn't release it either. Right. And I think that brings in another factor of <clears throat> the government and people in power and thinking of, I think there's some people in there that are totally corrupt and totally evil mm. that have the best interests of like Baal or Balak or whatever mm. gods they worship in the Peruvian Grove. But also there are people who are good hearted. That are in oh, there, for sure. that are in this dark world and dark system, that want the truth to be out there, and I think it's all in due time. It will be revealed. Interesting. So sorry, that was very long. No, it's good. But- I, I want to read a verse that applies to kind of what we're talking about. It's Ephesians five eleven. It says, "Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. 
for it is shameful even to speak of things that are done in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible, for anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead. Christ will shine on you. So look carefully how you walk, not as the unwise, but as wise. Hmm. So what's fascinating about that is it's almost like we don't want to know the truth. It's almost like knowing a lie is more comfortable. Also to be, to look at it to a more secular view just for a second, right, right. the mystery is a lot more fun. Ooh, and okay. I think that's what a lot of people get hung up on and what I've seen. Like people will search for truth and or just not care, right? But sometimes the mystery is even more enticing. Interesting like with the alien concept. And all Interesting. That kind of stuff. Okay. And also, truth or should I say deception is conveyed with a little bit of truth. It looks like a half truth. Like a half truth. Okay. And so when you see stuff like, I remember like this year and last year the UAP stuff mm-hmm. unidentified. I can't remember what the piece stands for. Flying, uh, Unidentified phenomenon. 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 And stuff like that. And me, I'm doing research into that and also research into principalities and power and what mm-hmm. that really means. And all these things are kind of not, I'm not like going deep in like conspiracy theory, whole for sure, stuff like for that. Sure. But I'm just trying to seek out truth more. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because I'm very careful of where to find it. Like you can find it on YouTube, sure, or websites or whatever. But you got to discern, and it's really hard to do that in this age because there's so many, conf- so much noise. I would say. So let me add to that. Go Christians. Right now, there is an epidemic in Christianity of relying on YouTubers for discernment. Mm-hmm. Uh, you could call them, you know, there's uh, discernment ministries they call them, and really, it's people offended, trying to just attack. And that we talked about that last podcast on unity versus division. And um, you just have to be careful where you're, what you're listening to. And if you're not getting it directly from the word of God or the Holy Spirit, you need to be very careful if you're a believer in Jesus that you're not deceived um, into over that overcorrection idea we talked about last time, right? Um, so where do we, what's the source? I have a question. What's the source mm. of discernment? Ooh. Man, you're throwing a zinger. David, do you have anything to add? Well, I would venture to say that the discernment comes from the Holy Spirit. There you go. Ultimately, discernment is not a a, a talent we have. It's yeah. not something that, you know, you become smarter and wiser and thus more discerning. You know, it's, it's a work of the Holy Spirit inside right. of you. Now, there is a gift of discernment, but that I think is, I think every believer needs discernment. Okay, mm-hmm. but there is a discerning of spirits. It's called by the Apostle Paul. Um, but that maybe go deeper. I think that goes pretty deep. Like when you're doing counseling, and you may know what the issue is. This person may know what to pray into. That kind of thing. Um, but I think overall, a general description. You're right. Like we all have to rely on the Holy Spirit. And to be honest, I think we've gotten a little lazy as Christians because we have so much information at our hands. It's easy to look at a YouTube video or look up, you know, ask ChatGPT what it thinks. Well, how about we pray? How about we go to the Lord and we discern that way, you know? Um, and at the farther we go, the more deceptions will come and the more we need it. What I would say is it's important to get quiet Ooh. because with all the information, and we've talked about the noise and quote <clears throat> before on this show, but I think it's really important to get quiet and seek the Lord out like you're saying because when we have something always going on in our ear or our head, it's very easy to get distracted. Right. And so it's important to get quiet and to kind of kind of recenter yourself, like the Bible says we need to do with our identity and to recenter ourselves or recenter ourselves and focus on the Lord. Mm. I went to a pastor's uh, retreat, kind of a prayer, they call it a prayer summit. And multiple denominations all coming together. I heard there's no coffee. I I found some. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Nick and Nicole were saying like, oh yeah, like they were out of coffee like day one and two. And yeah, well, like I have that. ways. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I keep the beans in the back seat. <laughs> I don't mess around. <laughs> anyway, um, part of our practice in that summit was to go take, I think it was 45 minutes, which is a long time. Wow. You sit by yourself quietly. 
and you reflect and you uh, I think the first question was what do you want what are you asking God for and the second question was what does he want you to do about it and it was great it was a great practice and so I encourage everybody to do that I know um, in the DTS program that YWAM does uh, their discipleship program they, they, they train people, like when you, when you study the Word of God, you read it, especially Psalms, it's really good to do this. And then you go and you sit and you, you soak in it, you just kind of reflect on it. What does this mean to me? How do I apply it to my life? All that good stuff. And I don't think we're taking time to do that in our daily devotional time, if we're taking any devotional time at all, that is, as Christians. Mm, yeah. But um, I get it. It's a struggle. But the lack of... Um, um, Personal decision-making when it comes to your spiritual walk has to be intentional. And we have become very lazy as Christians and it's showing. And so this is kind of my, uh, my battle cry to the Christians. Like this is the moment for us to start working on our personal spiritual walk with Jesus. Cause if we don't work on that, we're going to, the more deception comes, the less we're going to see it. And we may even believe it. And get roped into it. And it makes sense uh, from what I understand because it starts in the heart. And it starts right. where, like we just said, realigning. But it also starts where if you can't manage your own household, how are you going to go and discern what's even going on in the world? Right. If you can't discern and figure out stuff in your own walk, how are you going to do it when somebody else asks for help? Oh, for man. Example? That's a great point because how are you going to minister to others if you can't let the Holy Spirit minister to you? Mm. Dang, that'll preach. Dang, that'll preach. David, wow. what do you think over there? Um, yeah, I think <clears throat> nowadays distraction is such an easy thing to mm. fall into. Like, I mean, I I experience this in my own life, you know. It's like even on a day where I don't necessarily have anything to do per se. Right. Because, you know, we're all busy people. So that's one thing that can come up. Um, but sometimes... We're not busy, and yet we still aren't focusing on the Lord. We still aren't taking the time to just sit down and soak in His Word. That's good. To sit under His uh, His teaching, His presence, His counsel. Yeah. Because that's what we have the Holy Spirit for. That's what the Holy Spirit was given to us for, to counsel us, to teach us, to edify us. That's right. And it's so easy nowadays to... Uh, just be distracted by something or even nothing and fritter that time away, you know, and the long-term impact of that is we're just less capable um, when it comes to walking in the world as we're called to walk as Christians. It's good. I think calling back to what you, what you asked that about what a lie is or why people are deceived or whatever the question was, but I think it's more like it's, Oh, shoot, I just had it. I just had it. I just had it. I'm losing my thought Well, the, here. Qu the question was define deception. Yeah, define deception. And I think that is the perturbed truth. Ooh, okay. It's the truth that is not the truth at all. I mean, even a half truth is a lie. But people, it's the sprinkling of truth enough to get people to believe. Ooh, to. the bait. The bait. The bait. Yep. Something, the hook. The hook. So that, so you go back to the original sin of Adam and Eve. That was the crux, was the nature of God's character. So, you know, did he really say to not eat of the fruit, Eve? That's what Satan said. All the fruit in the garden? Yeah, you know? all of all <laughs> the fruit. And so he's exaggerating the point, um, trying to confuse her to get her to challenge the very character and nature of who God is. Is he really good? Is he really gracious? Is he really merciful? And to be honest, that same lie is prevalent in our hearts and minds today in the nature of deception is to sprinkle a little bit of truth. Oh, yeah, he did say don't eat of the fruit, but why? Right? Mm. And that's the question. Why are we to follow Jesus? Why am I to live my life? Why am I to even care about my spiritual growth in the first place? See, these are all things that I think the enemy bombards us with. Let me add one more verse, and then I want to get into a little bit of the spiritual dynamics of this. Okay. But this is uh, 2 Thessalonians 2.9. The Apostle Paul says, The coming of the lawless one, being the Antichrist, by the way. If you didn't know that, he's referring to the Antichrist. The lawless one is by activity of Satan 
and all power and false signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception. For those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. This is heavy. Yeah. This is crazy. This is it 2 Thessalonians? 2 Thessalonians 2, 9. Paul, hmm. The Apostle Paul is talking about the end of the age. Okay. He's talking about the Antichrist. Now, a couple things you need to understand about the Antichrist. <clears throat> There's two definitions here. One is a specific person at the end times. The other definition could be there has been many Antichrists who have already come among you. Okay. Stalin, Hitler, a spirit of Antichrist, if you will. Yeah. So there's a couple different ways to look at it. It doesn't matter how you look at it. What matters is the byproduct of what is happening. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing I want you to think about here in this question, God sent a delusion. This is the ESV version. He says delusion. Now, why would God send a delusion for those that are already deceived? What's mm. your thoughts on that? Pretty heavy. Yeah, that speaks to me of uh, God. Uh, it talks about in um, <clears throat> the first chapter of Romans where it says that uh, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. There you go, yeah. So, and then you also have in Exodus when it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Hmm. And that, that I think that's caused some, that's caused some like, you know, debate. <laughs> Discussion. Calvinism. Argument <laughs> over the sovereignty of God versus free will. Absolutely. But the way I tend to look at it is that God hardening Pharaoh's heart was in the same, was the same thing that happens in Romans chapter one, God gave Pharaoh over mm -hmm. to his resistance, to his stubbornness. Mm. Um, and I think the same thing, the same thing is being talked about in that verse is people who are clinging to their delusion and their deception so hard that God just gives them over to it. Can I give you a hack for this? So uh, an easy way to describe this, I've preached this a couple different ways with the whole free will versus predestination idea but the the way i would describe this is if you're going to choose to resist the lord and to believe a lie and you love that lie more than truth guess what god will give you what you want sadly and that's hard don't get me wrong his will is that none will be lost but that all will be saved that is his nature and his character however this is why the cliff of deception is so dangerous and why we should stay nowhere near it. We should desire the truth and love mm. the truth. Okay. Mm. David, or David, sorry. <laughs> Javid. Um, uh, Javid, go. <laughs> um, it's fascinating because I'm doing a lot of research on principalities and powers and what that entails. Mm. I don't know if we'll get to it today, but what it reminds me of is, I think what you said is right on, David. Uh, David, I almost called you David again. <laughs> that, <laughs> David, I think you're right on because when we desire stuff, we kind of have a thing as humans where we have the will to make things happen. Mm. And Good even point. to defy, defy God. Mm. And because we, we are his beings that he created and we have power. Um, and we are only saved through him. That's, that's the truth. Amen. However, there are not, however, but as well, there is, if people are focused on something enough and they are like, they have it set on their mind to achieve it. Yeah. Because Pharaoh didn't want to let his people go. Right. He didn't have the he didn't have the case of let my let my people go. However, oh, <laughs> however, I've never heard that. You never heard no. that. Oh, it's great. I'm gonna um, use that in a sermon someday. <laughs> there you go. I have the meme I'll send to you. But anyway, um, I, it's interesting how like God. It says here, right? It's a, I have the New Living Translation. So God will cause them to be greatly deceived. And they will believe these lies. Verse 12, they will, then they will be condemned for enjoying evil rather than believing truth. But I think the heart can be deceived. And I think what, I think what you're right, David, I think is they were giving themselves over to that is kind of what I'm thinking because the desire is already there. 
God was kind of just, I don't know. It seems like he's just letting them go there and letting them over to their deception. But it's them giving up on him and rejecting him as well. Yeah, and one thing too is... I don't know how accurate all that is. I'm still <laughs> learning, but it's what I mean, it sounds, you know. Uh, we all are. We but all are. <laughs> one thing too is my the way I understand how the Holy Spirit works is God doesn't desire that anyone should be lost. That's right. So he's always drawing on people's hearts, and it's his drawing that gives us the grace to be able to believe um, in him in the first place. Right. So he's always drawing on our hearts, drawing on our hearts. But I think at a certain point, when someone uh, clings to their delusion so hard that... Um, they totally resist God. I think that's when God stops drawing on them. And it's mm. unfortunate because I can think of people that I've seen in my life kind of give up on God and kind of just do their own thing. But it's time after time after time again where the opportunity presents itself to those people of redemption, of forgiveness, of retribution with another fellow uh, fellow believer. Right. But they still will hold their ground say, mm. and stick to their guns and quote, and not submit to the Lord, you know, I, I'm going to be vulnerable right now, but I, <clears throat> I have, uh, in the last week, I have four friends that have come to me, all of them in crisis in some format or another. And the crisis in their lives is a result of, um, bad choices, deception and sin they've lived in. Mm. And I, it's odd that things happen all at once. You know, you look at this yeah. and you're like, God, what, why is this a pattern? You know, mm. um, and I don't have direct contact with all of them, you know, to be able to help. But I think about our choices and I think about the importance of what we do, the importance of our thought life, the importance of our heart condition, the importance of our attitude, and how that affects our spiritual walk. And I think we disassociate those two ideas that my day to day, battle with my flesh, you know, and, and whatever it is, my struggles in my life, the sins I'm trying to conquer through the help of Jesus and his freedom he brings, and how important that is to focus on or I'll lose the focus of why I exist. My identity is at stake mm. in reality. Can I, read, can I read something? Go for it. Go for it. <clears throat> Ephesians 2. Um, let's see where do I want to start. Yeah, we're going to start in verse 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you were once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of our body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. This is my favorite part. Verse 4 says, but God. Mm Mm-hmm being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised up with him, seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming age, you might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. So there's first off, there's three things he lists the world, the flesh, and the devil. Okay. Prince Pali of the, the prince of the power of the air is actually Satan himself, which is fascinating when you study it because Satan is described as a prince many times. Mm-hmm. Christ is described as a son. Prince is a political authority. You have authority over a small reign over an area, but you don't have, the king can overrule you. Mm-hmm. But a son gets everything the king gets and the authority the king has. Mm, inheritance. Yeah. The full inheritance where the prince may not necessarily. Fascinating when you study that. So go study that. Anyway, then you go on to the purpose of why he saved us. That he, we may display that he can show the riches of his grace and the kindness towards us. So there's a purpose to our walk. There's a purpose to us not being deceived. There's a purpose to us knowing the truth mm-hmm. and walking in that truth. And it's important. And this is what I think I want people to get is that it's important. 
your spiritual growth. It's important that you understand the grace of God mm. and that you surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Because if you don't, deception will grasp you. And uh, in the words of, uh, oh man, you got to serve somebody, David. Uh, um. Jeez, why am I forgetting it right Bob now? Dylan. Bob, Bob Dylan. Dylan. <laughs> Bob Dylan. Yeah. So in the words of Bob Dylan, you have to serve somebody. And if you mm-hmm. don't submit to Christ, guess what you're going to submit to? The mm-hmm. prince of the power of the air. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. And it's interesting because I was doing a lot of research about this last night where I think I'm losing my train of thought right now. I just had it. And then the Bob Dylan thing happened, so. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> Bob Dylan did it again. Bob Dylan did it again. Um, but it's, oh, oh, here it is. It's the, what happens when there's absence of Christ in your life. Mm. And what I've noticed and what I've observed and what I've read in the Bible is when you don't have Christ in your life and this world throws its stuff at you. Right. And the, and the, and the, the prince and the devil and Satan, they come for you. Mm. And whatever else influences are there that are against God, Mm. that is what you're subject to because the devil is run loose in this world. The evil is run loose in this world that was meant to be Eden originally. Right. And then it was broken. So now it's perverted. Mm. But there's also a spiritual realm. Mm -hmm. And that has direct influence on this world because Mm. it was broken. It was once one, I believe. I could be wrong. But now it's broken. Mm. So when you don't have Christ in your life, what are you subject to? Mm. Whatever's in this world. Right. And through Christ and through Jesus. Yeah, people say, yeah, you're saved. Okay, but what does that really mean? Right. What does that mean when you're saved? It means that you are, like we've just said, inherited mm. the power and inherited the, the passage away, mm. basically. Inheritance. Inheritance. Kind of... In- yeah, go for it. Well, I just want to break this down a yeah. little bit. Break different. it a little bit down. I'm, uh, you, you're, I know what I'm trying to get. I just don't right, know how to articulate just, there's, it. Right. There's a way to describe <laughs> there's this a way to that describe would break it. it down a little easier. So yeah. three things, the world, the flesh, mm-hmm. and the devil, okay? Yeah. Those are our three battle fronts, mm-hmm. okay? The, let's start with the flesh. The flesh is in you, okay? You're born into it. It's, it's part of the animalistic nature of this world, and it's every person's battle. You must conquer it. It's one thing Cain was told in Genesis 4. Uh, God told him, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is mm. to devour you, but you must master it. Fascinating. It's like... Which means there's power over it. And it's a predator. It's a predator. It's sin is this predator that's going out. And it, Peter talks about the, the lion waiting, roaring lion waiting to devour Here's you. a great analogy. The world has all these, this evil, right? Mm-hmm. It has, like you said, crouching at the door, ready to pounce. Mm-hmm. It's a predator. What do you need to defend yourself from a predator? Mm. You need to, you know, put on the armor of God and all that stuff, but right. you kind of need a gun. And this kind mm. of equips you to handle the predators in this world. How about a sword? A sword will work. Yeah, the sword of the spirit, which sword is the, the word of God, mm-hmm. Ephesians 6. Now, now, so the flesh... So, yeah, continue. continue. <clears throat> the world is different than the flesh. You have to understand the difference. The flesh is something you... It's kind of the negative negativity in you all the time. But the world is like gravity. It's this constant pull. It's this constant push. It's this constant pressure in the midst... And this is where deception comes in. It's like, we want you to bow to something. Mm -hmm. There's this pressure to give in. There's this pressure to go with the flow. There's this pressure to to get you off course, which by the way, one of the translations of sin in the Greek, um, I forgot the actual word. It's in, it's in John eight, which I'm going to read here in a minute. John eight, he describes sin as as two definitions. One is missing the mark, which is an archery term. The, The other definition is wandering off the path. So what do those two definitions have in common? Wandering off the path and missing a, a target when you're aiming. Any ideas? Well, to me, it brings to mind the idea that there's a way to go and you didn't go that way. Yeah, a choice, right? There's a choice. Any ideas, Jake? Or? Well, I mean, you're, the goal is to hit the target, right? Mm-hmm. Or to walk continual down the path. Mm-hmm. 
And when you miss, you miss, you have failed your goal. Mm. You've not achieved what you set out to do. I got to read this <laughs> and then I'm going to explain it because you have to see it mm -hmm. in the scriptures. So it's going to be John 8, verse 31 is where I'm going to start. Okay, I'm just going to read real quick, and then I'll explain it. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, and these are, these are Jews that he persuaded when he preached to them. Okay, these, you could say there may, may, some of them may have even been Pharisees. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Verse 33, they answered to him, we are offspring of Abraham and never have been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Because they believed that if you were a descendant of Abraham, you were automatically saved. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, anyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Oh, And the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you are free indeed. Oh, that's so good. So this word sin here in the Greek is what I'm talking about in verse 36, or 35 and 36. And the two things that wandering off the path and missing the mark have in common is concentration, mm. a lack of concentration. Okay. I had a friend just the other night. He's an, he's been, he's been an archer and I've been, t I told him how I didn't, haven't taken up archery cause I'll get obsessed with it. <laughs> and I know I will cause I want to be, I want to master you it. Be the best. Yeah. I want to master Around. it. And so I purposely haven't gotten into it cause I don't have time. And he said, you know, there's a scientific fact that if you shoot 17 arrows a night within 90 days, you'll be able to shoot an animal at 50 yards. Interesting. I was like, what? What? <laughs> I'm thinking thousands of, and millions of shots to become that good. He said, no, it's not about the amount of shots. It's about the consistency of how often you do it. And he, how many days did he say, by the way? 90 days. So it's the pattern. So it's like less than 200 arrows. Well, whatever, right. right or whatever. But, but it's not about the arrows. Uh -huh. It's about the consistency. Mm. He said here in verse 31, if you abide in my word and are truly my disciples, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And then verse 34, he says, anyone who practices sin mm. is a slave to it. It's not just sinning. It's practicing at it. Is it dolus? Uh, yeah, I, I can look it up real quick. Or if you like, just or to clarify. D O U L O U S. <clears throat> Isn't that, uh, yeah, it's what it's in, right? Amartya. Isn't well, that the word? Hold on, let me find it. I have a, dish, a dictionary right here. Yeah, mine says just rendering of the Greek word. Dolos. Here it is. Uh, no, harmatia. Harmatia. You were right. You were wrong. Yep. You're pretty much there, David. So this is the harmatia is the Greek word that that uses these two analogies. Now it's way deeper than that. There's so many more definitions, but those are the two generic basic uh, analogies. And if you pay attention, if you're on a wandering on a path and you just do do do, you're daydreaming. You're distracted. You're mm. not paying attention. You're going to wander into the woods. If you're shooting an arrow, and by the way, there's a lot of science to shooting an arrow. If you know, like you're, you're supposed to hold back. You're supposed to steady your muscles. You're supposed to breathe out, let go, because you can't have ten, you can't have anxiety up. You have to be relaxed. Interesting. So you apply all these analogies to your consistency in your life, and the difference between a, a, a sin where oh man I lost my temper today, versus I am an angry person all the time. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. A lifestyle versus once in you know oh, I slipped up today. It's like, no, this is a lifestyle. Mm. I have made this sin an identity. Mm. A deception is now what I live in. And I don't just live in it. I own it. I take it on as my own. And this is the world we live in. And, and it gets to the point where that deception, you have to affirm it. You have to accept it like I accept it. Or you're my enemy. Mm. Do you see the nature of the spiritual war going on behind this deception? Mm. And this is kind of what I'm, Jesus said, the truth will set you free. It means there you're enslaved. This is what the Jews didn't get. They're like, we're enslaved to no one. Mm -hmm. We're Abraham's <laughs> descendants. <laughs> And that's really the nature of deception, too, is you don't realize you're enslaved to deception. When they, when um, I it's read, like the, yeah. uh, uh, it's the Laodicea, right? Yeah. In the book of Revelation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, basically, John's writing to them, and he's saying, 
you well, you guys say about yourselves, well, we have need of no one, blah, 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 right. blah, blah. But you don't realize that you're poor, blind, pitiful, yep. and naked. Woo. And that's what ends up happening when you're deceived. Yeah. So good, David. And I didn't even think of that. That was a great uh, reference. Because we the the only way to really battle deception, then this is this is something our generation struggles with, uh, Gen Z and and millennials, um, is this this community. Mm. The only way to con- really conquer deception besides the Holy Spirit giving you revelation or the Word of God is is people saying, "Hey, bud, you're off course. Mm-hmm. Hey, bud, those last fifty arrows you shot are in the neighbor's fence." Or in the neighbor's window. You miss the target completely. Oh, yeah. See what I'm saying? Like, there's this accountability. Yeah, accountability. That's the word. There's this accountability that is necessary. And that's what Jesus is doing here to these Pharisees. He's saying, hey, you guys are off course and you're committing sin. You're, it's not just a once in a while thing. And getting to the word commit in the Greek, it's fascinating. It means to own. Mm, to carry on. To carry a name. Mm. Which is fascinating because you get into don't take the Lord's name in vain. And the Hebrew word for vain means carry a flag like you do into battle. Mm-hmm. Huh. That's wow. a whole nother study whole you nother, can go into. Yeah. yeah. Where the, the, we think taking the Lord's name in vain is cussing. Mm-hmm. It's not just cussing. That could, be a, could apply to that. But it's also, what flag are you toting in your life? Yeah. Do you represent Jesus? Or are you representing something else and you say you love Jesus or you follow Jesus? But your flag says something else. Mm-hmm. So hypocrisy, right? And it's so interesting, too, that you bring up accountability. Because when you think about it, if accountability is the way in which we guard against deception, then so many things in the culture begin to make sense. Mm. Because there are certain things that people believe that they certain ways people live and the in a sort of free and open democratic society the ideal is to kind of say well maybe you believe that maybe you want to live that way but that's not for me you do you and mm. I'll do me but those who are trapped in that deception, that's not good enough for them. Right. Because they need people around them telling them what they want to hear. Mm. Otherwise, someone may come in and say something contrary to the lie they believe. Well, that's the nature of a cult, right? The nature of a cult is you need to keep the lie going. And you better not dare think for yourself. Mm -hmm. You better agree with the leader. And if you dare disagree with the leader, you're out of the cult. We're kicking you out. Right? It's deception in itself. It's manifesting in that context of a creepy cult, right? There's a lot of cults that have come out, like, <laughs> been exposed the last several years. And this is the nature of that. Don't you dare think freely. How dare you have a free thought? And now, don't you dare. I mean, let's talk about political ideology, shall we? Mm. It's like, don't you dare think different than your party. You better agree with me. You better fall in line. You better fall in line. Yeah. And that's the nature of deception. And yeah. I think it's time we get into the spiritual side of this because we talked about the world, we talked about the flesh, but let's talk about the devil. What, at what point is there influence from the enemy spiritually versus my choices to follow? Similar to God calling me, like David talked about with free will and, and his divine call in your life, there's also an enemy trying to call you another direction. Mm-hmm. Equally as much as God is... I, I, I would say God is greater, obviously. But there is there is influence. There's large pull. There's a pull. Yeah. So you, the flesh is in you. The world is outside of you pulling you in gravity. But then the enemy, I think, is deceiving you. The nature of deception comes directly from the demonic realm. Mm. I truly believe that. You see it in the garden. You see it with Cain killing Abel. You see it with Babylon. You see it all the way through the Bible. And we can get into Genesis 6 if you want. That's a whole nother idea of deception manifested physically mm, on the earth. Yeah. Spiritual and physical meeting. And it's, it's a little scary. And it comes from rebellion. Ooh. That's what it word. comes from. Yep. It comes from, I don't like the way things are going. I want, I want, I want. Mm. It's an ego thing. And 
something I, I can't remember what it was in a video or a, a, a thing I read today, but it was like deception or no rebellion. As long as there's rebellion, oh, shoot, I don't remember the quote, but it's, it was really great. It was like something like rebellion and he was talking about rebellion and something about if there's always rebellion, there's always a, there's always a divide of some sort, mm. obviously. Because there's rebellion. You're rebellion, right. like the principalities rebelled against God, Satan against God, all these things. What's the opposite of rebellion? Unity. Mm. Maybe. Mm. Well, I, I think it goes say deeper obedience, than Obedience, maybe? Submission. Oh, well, submission. submission. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Same idea. idea. Um, but it, what's, what you talked about rebellion, and it made me think of, I can't remember what's found, but it's uh, where it says, uh, uh, rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. Oh, yeah. Oh, that was it. Yeah. Um, Whenever there's rebellion, there is witchcraft, is what the guy said. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. a, that's a like verse. That. In, like that. First, just, first Samuel 15, 23. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There we go. Um, Look at you. <laughs> thank you, JMO. <laughs> it says, uh, 15, 23 says, For the rebellion is a sin, is the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is the iniquity and idolatry because thou hast rejected the word of. Of the Lord. Now, when they're talking, hold, hold on, on. Sorry, sorry. He, think- he hath also rejected thee from being king. Talking about Saul. Mm-hmm. Yikes. Oh. Talk about pride. Yeah, because he, got, he let all that stuff into the, his oh, kingdom. Oh, man. Dude. And so it's, so it's, very, it's very interesting that the Bible describes rebellion in that way because it's like if we decide we don't want to submit to God, mm. it's all there's, um, it's not just. It's not a small thing, but it's like the power of darkness is being exercised over our lives in that moment. Yeah. So you're you're almost inviting it. Mm-hmm. Mm. Like a willing, a willing. Guess. Like a vampire knocking at the door. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I don't mean to get creepy, but almost host like. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Like 100%. I'm a home. Come live in me. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can get into the demonic, you can get into possession and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so what, before you go to your next thing, when it's talking about witchcraft, it's talking about Saul, correct? And in the, in the context of he let all this stuff into the kingdom and, and blah, 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 and, and rebellion against God. Right. Mm-hmm. But wh- how does it apply to the modern day? How does the rebellion and witchcraft apply to us today? Because I don't see occult stuff on the news really, but I see people going away from God and I see a lack of submission. So what is, how does okay. r- witchcraft apply Re- to us? Remind me of that question. I need to okay. define this okay. word okay. for rebellion in the Hebrew first. All right, no worries, no worries. It, it, so it has two definitions. Me, uh, Mary, mm. but the actual, that's, a, that's from the root word, uh, Mara. Okay, it means to be continuous, re, continue in rebellion, fract, uh, refractory and disobedient towards someone. Um, what else here? To show disobedience on display. What's the other one here? Um, oh, this is what I wanted. It says here, the root to be or make one bitter, unpleasant, Ooh. figuratively to rebel and resist, causatively to provoke with bitterness. That's fascinating that bitterness is tied into it in the Hebrew. Um, because what I see is you need to be angry at someone. You better be mad. Something mm. happened. So we're designed for justice. Yeah. But it's almost like a fake reason to be mad. It's mm. a fake call. It's a fake thing to, to be right, saying. be just, yeah. have justice for mm-hmm. when the reality is God requires justice for him. And to be honest, he's the only judge and justice giver, right? So it, it, it's almost the bitter nature of bitterness is a root that tries to steal God's job. And us take on a mantle and a gavel and a, a gown we're not supposed to carry. You get into judgment, you get into unforgiveness. It leads to all kinds of things, but the ultimate word rebellion leads to rebellion against God. Now repeat your question, please. Okay, so the question was, when it's talking about witchcraft and all these kind of things, mm-hmm. how does it apply today? Because things are much different today compared to the past and, the, mm. and what he, they're talking about in the time of Saul. Oh, I think it's exactly the same as today. Like the, uh, I, I, yeah. the difference is the megaphone's bigger. 
Mm. That's the difference. The difference is everything's online. Everything's on the news. Everything is amplified tenfold. And so we see it more. I don't know if it's, I, I do believe evil is growing, but also I believe God is pouring a spirit out on our flesh at the same time. I think it's, sorry, David, I'll let you go. But I think it's part of what kingdom you're aligned with. Mm. Because back in that day, if you were aligned with Israel or if you were aligned with the people in the North or if you're aligned with the kingdoms of the East, like idol worshipers, like idol worshipers, yeah. like you had to find a home mm. somewhere. You had to plant your flag or plant your home and your homestead somewhere. And so you want to be in the correct kingdom. And so when Paul Saul let in all of that, he kind of corrupted and um, gave a bad smell to the whole thing. Mm. He went away from God. And so in today's modern time, how do you apply that here? Mm. How do you apply in what kingdom you live in? Where your mind is most of the time is what I would probably connect it to. Uh, but I was going to say that part of, the, part of the deception nowadays is that we live in a, in a more rational, secular, materialistic <laughs> world. And We've been through the Enlightenment. Those, uh, <laughs> you know... You know, the dark forces, witchcraft, demons are just hokey, old fashioned <laughs> beliefs that, you know, we need to live we need to leave behind. Um when the reality is is those same dark forces are at work even more today than yep. they were in the yep. time of Saul. Mm -hmm. It's just we're more blind to them. Exactly. So so the nature the nature of witchcraft is manipulation. Mm -hmm. Okay, think of like voodoo. The nature, the idea of voodoo is that I have a puppet I hurt, and that hurting that puppet hurts you. Mm. The very nature of hatred. Jesus went to the heart. If you hate your brother, you kill them. If you've lusted, you've committed adultery. Mm. So that's what the nature of manipulation is like. I, I'm, I'm going to move this puppet to move you. I'm going to lie to you. I'm going to deceive you to get what I want out of you. Mm. It's rooted in selfishness, which is one of the things Jesus sets us free from, by the way, because mm. he calls us to die to ourself. That means crucify the old nature, Romans 6. Crucify the old you. Don't just make it better. Don't self-help it. Kill it. Mm. Die to self. Live for Christ. You can't make the old your flesh better. You really can't. You have to die to your flesh and live in the spirit. And it's part of our nature to become more and more like Jesus as we are sanctified. That's the theological word here, sanctification, which is a process, by the way. Um, I repeat your question. Just how does witchcraft apply to today? Oh, okay, great question. That's okay. Versus, That's I was going. versus what? You had to remind me. Yeah. So um, I, think, I think the prince of the power of the air is a great analogy because whoever has the aircraft in a war— has the upper hand. Airstrikes conquer. And if you have a ground game, it means nothing if you have an airstrike. Mm. If you have a water game, if you have a fleets fighting in the water, they mean nothing compared to an airstrike. So when I think of it, Prince of the Power of the Air, I think of air waves. I think of information. Oh. I think of media. I think of things I'm consuming. And how that consuming changes me. I'll never forget, like, it was back in like 29, it was before COVID even, I used to listen to news talk all day. So I drive for UPS, so I, I'm a driver, I, I deliver packages all day, so I'm on my, I'm in the car, and I would listen to news, and I'd have 15 different news outlets, and I'd like a variety, so I'd listen to like, you know, libertarian, conservative, I'd bounce back and forth, and man, I would just be in a bad mood. Mm-hmm. I'd start out information. I would just crave information. And it got to the point where I would be angry. <laughs> Why am I angry? <laughs> well, I'm listening to negativity all day. Mm. We don't understand what we're eating. Oh, we really don't understand man. what we're eating. There you go. And we need you to be it. careful what airwaves we're picking up. Mm. And is the prince of the power of the air involved? See, here's my question. At what level... Is that spiritual influence getting into us? And at what level are we partnering with it? Mm. And this is, we, we need to talk a little bit about Genesis 6. Because yeah. we talked about rebellion. Mm -hmm. 
And Genesis 6 is the, the second rebellion. That's the second. Yep, the second rebellion. So the first rebellion is Adam and Eve. Mm-hmm. In Genesis 6, there's a second rebellion. And it's it's really yeah. mystic because it doesn't... Genesis 6 does not explain very yeah. well. Mm-hmm. It's more of a snapshot or a peek in an eye, a keyhole of what I think is a bigger context. And and did you want to share a little bit about Genesis 6? You were just like itching to talk. I I, I, I've been... <sighs> I've been doing so much consumption of information about this kind of stuff. Right. And I watched two wonderful documentaries last night, uh, hosted and 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 about Michael Heiser. Yeah. And he's a theologian. He, he's a theologian. Yep. And he's sadly no longer with us. Yeah, he, he passed died. away in yeah. 2019, I yep. think. Yep. And these are free documentaries you can find on YouTube. One was done, I think it was called Demons. Mm-hmm. Uh Something it was just called demons or something like that, and then the second one I watched was the unseen realm. Yeah, that's a book too, and that's the book. That's the book. So, and these are both based off books, and they kind of compress <clears throat> it into a documentary that are both about an hour each, and they dive into Genesis six and how it. I find it hard to describe it to people. I remember I was watching them last night, and I'm like, "Oh, this is what it means." Okay, there is Satan, and then there was also the serpent. And then there's also, I mean, what does what Genesis yeah, so 6 say? Let, Let's let get me, into Genesis for, 6 and first what does it off, say? First yeah. off, we need to give a disclaimer. Yeah, disclaimer. Okay. Yeah. Michael Heiser mm-hmm. uses original Hebrew text. Mm-hmm. He's really big on the original Hebrew, which I appreciate about him because I'm really big on original language too. Um, he does reference Enoch quite a bit. Yeah. So as a pastor, I need to give a disclaimer uh, that Enoch is not scripture. Okay. Is not the inspired word of God. It was specifically taken out for reasons. I believe, David, you can help me with this. I believe the first reason was the author uh, not only was unknown, but it isn't accurate. They believed it was Enoch, but that was actually a lie mm-hmm. when they stud- researched it in um, the Council of Nicaea, right? When they were researching it. Um, yeah, I think it's been a while since I've looked into this, but I'm... My understanding is that it had mostly to do with the uh, the misattribution of the work to Enoch. Right. And by the way, I have friends who have gotten into the Apocrypha books, and they've gotten way off course. Mm-hmm. It can really mess your head up. So you do need to be very, you very, gotta, very careful. You got to discern. You, gotta be you have to discern. Yeah. The Word of God is inspired and accurate for a reason, and the Council of Nicaea was not a weekend with a bunch of guys making decisions. It was <laughs> yeah. a long 10-year right process, a long time. I mean, the, it take it 20 years. It was the a, canon of scripture, like, I think when, when you talk about the canon of scripture, people have this idea that there was like one council where they got together and hashed it out. No. And it was like, as far as the, the Catholic church is concerned, the canon of scripture, um, councils regarding the canon of scripture carried on to like the 1500s. Well, not only that, but what they ended up canonizing was already in practice in most churches. Yeah. So it was already kind of agreed upon in smaller groups that this is actually uh, credible because it was by authors of people who either saw Jesus and or directly connected to him. Yeah, and then if you look at um, if you look at the people who um, whose writings survive the period directly after the uh, the apostles. Mm-hmm. Um, they're called the early church fathers. Right. So if you look at the writings of the early church fathers, you can see that the early church largely agreed on what was scripture and what wasn't. Right. So these councils and the deliberation on it uh, years or even centuries later was merely to confirm something that had already had been known um, so that it could serve as a, as a defense against someone coming in later trying to dispute that. And, and by the way, we need to clarify, the, the, the books of the Bible were written by human beings, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Mm. When you read the Bible, you need to have the Holy Spirit involved in that in your mm-hmm. personal life. It's not words on a page, mm. okay? It's life-giving bread mm. to oh, your yeah. spirit. And therefore, you need the Holy Spirit. And my grandfather had a great uh, way of describing. He said, every time you sit down and read your Bible, you need to say, Lord, help teach me what this means in my life. Mm. Apply it to my life. Uh, Bring the Holy Spirit into it. 
because the, there's a lot of Christians who look at it as these are words on a page. Well, the problem is you get into study and then there's one scruple and you're freaking out trying to defend your faith. Mm. This is the problem. We need to be inspired by the Holy Spirit as we read it too. Mm. Now, the word of God is the word of God. The book is the book. And by the way, it's not a book, it's a library. Mm. That's another way to describe oh, it. Yeah. yeah, it's a library. It, and it's been tested and tried for 2,000 years. Yep. Yeah. So this is how you look at the Bible, and there's a big group of people, millennials and Gen Zers, that are like, "Oh, the Council of Nicaea was fake." It's like you really, <laughs> you really have not studied the Bible. Yeah, it has very little to do with the Catholic <laughs> Church and a lot more to do with the Holy Spirit inspiring multiple churches mm -hmm. to follow what is the Word of God. So yeah. anyway, and you, you can need to see. Do I mean, you can see um, what the early church, what the church knew even all the way back to the apostles themselves. Absolutely. Peter, in his letters, talks about people trying to, unstable people trying to distort scripture. Right. And he's referencing Paul's writings. Yep, absolutely. Mm. Now, this is where we go into Enoch. First thing you need to understand, Enoch was pulled out for specific reasons. Mm. And I believe, personally as a pastor, it's okay to use for historical references. Yeah. Would I necessarily yeah. preach from it every Sunday? Absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> Absolutely not. I would not call it the inspired word of God. But if you want to use it as a reference historical document, yeah. I think there's nothing wrong with that. So that being said, he, Enoch is referenced in Scripture by Jude and I believe Peter, right? Was it first or second Peter? There's two different passages. You can look it up. Uh, it is referenced. So... There's well, a little validity to it. Uh, if I rem you, so you have in Genesis, right? You have it talks about Enoch who and says he walked with God yep. and then was no more. Yep. And then you also have isn't it Numbers references Enoch? Or I could be wrong. It, it, you could look it up. And then you, you also have in Jude. Um, Jude actually. Uh, now, if I, you you might know this. I can't remember if the Enoch who is the supposed author of the book of Enoch and the Enoch who walked with God and was no more in Genesis, are they even the same Enoch? They're supposed to be. Okay, they're supposed to be. So I, I, I've read Enoch once. Um, I've referenced it many, many times, but uh, reading different parts. But Enoch gives a little window into an idea of what the spirit world could be like. Yeah. And, and by the way, Jewish scholars and rabbis believed Enoch was scripture during the time of Jesus. So you have to understand their context of the book of Enoch is actually, Enoch describes common Jewish theology. Yeah, but, but what I was going to say, which kind of dovetails nicely into that, is Jude actually quotes the book of Enoch yeah, correct. in his book. Yep. He doesn't just reference the person Enoch. No, 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 no. He actually quotes the book. A, a, a portion of the book, right, a, a verse. Yeah, I have yeah. Jude 14 here. Okay. It says, Enoch, who lived in the seventh generation after Adam, prophesied about these people. He said, listen, the Lord, is, and this is quotes, it says, listen, the Lord is coming with countless thousands of his holy ones mm. to, to execute judgment on the people of the world. Ooh. Excuse me. He will convict every person of all the ungodly things <laughs> they have done. It's like forbidden knowledge. Jeez. So let me start at 15. To execute judgment on the people of the world. Right. He will convict every person of all the ungodly things they have done and for all the insults that ungodly sinners have spoken against them. Okay, now let me clarify what that's yeah. talking about. Yeah. He's referring to the sins of the rebellion from three different places. Mm -hmm. The fall in, in, in Genesis 3 with Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. The, the fall at the Tower of Babel mm -hmm. and Genesis 6. Mm -hmm. So there's three different rebellions three Enoch different. talks about. Yeah. Now, we need to, to get into the spiritual context of deception. We need to get mm -hmm. into this. Enoch talks about these things called the Watchers. Now, the Watchers are described in Enoch as um, part of what's called the Divine Council. Mm -hmm. Okay. The word Elohim in Genesis 6. Let me read Genesis 6 real quick. Yeah. It says, when the man began to multiply on the face of the land, and the daughters were born to them. This is Genesis 6, 1. The sons of God saw the daughters of men were attractive, and they took the, as their wives uh, any they chose. By the word, the word take there is actually forceful rape. Mm. Okay. Cover your ears, hide your kids, hide your wives. Okay? <laughs> and then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is the flesh. He is flesh. There's the flesh we talked about. His days shall be 120. Verse 4, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, 
when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were the old men of renown. So we're, we have the, this scenario, and this is Bible, by the way. This is in divinely inspired scripture, Genesis 6, 1 through 4. So we have these, these Elohim is the word, the mm. sons of God. The Elohim, by the way, is not necessarily Yahweh. Mm -hmm. Okay, Yahweh is a special name given to God with Abraham. Mm -hmm. You have to understand this. Elohim in the Hebrew is a divine little G gods. Yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. It can be referred to as big G God. Yeah. Yeah. But generally it's not. Yeah. It's off been used as both. As both, off. right. Yeah. So you just have to understand that. Well, it's kind of like in uh it's kind of like in English how we have the word God and the word God can refer to a lot of things that aren't God. Correct. Yeah. For sure. So this is the context in Genesis 6 is that these these little G gods or spiritual entities, I would call them came down and inhabited, or well, they didn't inhabit anything. It just says they came down and procreated with women, uh, creating the Nephilim. Now, the Nephilim is referred to in uh, Joshua and throughout throughout the rest of the Bible, you'll see them. Now, what's fascinating is this is pre-flood. Mm -hmm. Joshua is post-flood. Mm -hmm. So if the flood happened and all the Nephilim were killed, how are they existing after the flood? Now, this is where Enoch comes in, because Enoch talks about the Elohim coming back down, the watchers coming back down and giving oh. unholy knowledge to men. Mm. Now that's fascinating because it's almost like they taught them to make weapons, swords, kill each other, uh, sorcery, witchcraft. The, so that Enoch talks about spiritual entities, demons, mm. AKA yeah. demonic forces coming down and re-educating evil men for the purpose of destroying God, a.k.a. the Tower of Babel. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the ideas in Enoch is that this is how the Nephilim continued, is that it happened multiple times throughout history. Now, that's not proven. It's a theory. You have to understand this, okay? So this is important as we go forward. Um, another side note you need to understand about the book of Enoch is it refers to... It refers to demons as soulless, or I'm sorry, bodiless spirits, mm. okay? They, they, there is belief in, in Enoch that when the, the Nephilim were killed in the flood, their spirits, aka demons, were bodiless, which is why when Jesus shows up in Matthew 1, there's a lot of demonic activity. Yeah. Because the demons are looking... They know what's going down. They're looking for a home. Mm -hmm. Now you fast forward, um, Matthew uh, 12, 43, Jesus said, when you cast out a demon, the demon goes to the dry places and it looks for a home. Can't find a home. Huh. So it returns back, finding the home clean and swept and brings back seven of his friends worse than the first. Fascinating, right? Fascinating. So yeah. if you ever want to study demonology, yeah, yeah, read what Jesus said about it. He has a lot of interesting context. For he said demons. they go into the desert, but dry places. You dry can call places. it a desert. Um, mm -hmm. There is a lot of uh, scriptural references in the Greek and the Hebrew for the Holy Spirit being referenced with water. In fact, in Genesis one one, you will see the water hovering upon the face of the deep, upon the waters. That's the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, floated upon the waters. So there's this connection to water and spirit throughout the whole Bible, which makes sense why the demons would like dry places because mm -hmm. there's no spirit per se. Like a know. desert or something. You're right. Yeah. Well, Jesus went into what? Yeah. To get tempted. A desert. A desert. And also in Joshua, when they were killing the animals and of the cultures that they were mm -hmm. trying to get rid of, why did they get rid of those animals? Because mm. they were animals of the desert. Yep. And what did the de animals of the desert consume? What was there to eat? Nothing. So mm. what would they eat? Anything. So they eat dead bodies. Mm, so that's why they're Anything unclean. They can, that's why they're unclean. That's why they're unclean. Yeah. So if you go into Deuteronomy with the scapegoat, if you remember mm -hmm. studied the scapegoat, the scapegoat is they say take uh, is casting a lot. You have two animals. One is chosen to be sacrificed. The other one you send into the desert. And I, I can't remember the name of the de it has a specific demonic entity named. Is Belel? Is it Belel? I can't remember. You have to look it up. It's in Deuteronomy. But the idea is that in the desert is where the demon resides. Mm. Mm. Where did Israel wander for 40 years? In the desert. The desert. You, you start studying scripture. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. It's fascinating, yeah. So let, let's, get back so to, let's get back to... Let's get back to demons and the mm. idea of the soulless demons. Now, mm. I... And, and before you go, I just want to say that <clears throat> 
watching this stuff and 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 learning about this kind of thing, to me, it provides more context, context yep. and more nuance mm-hmm. to what I already believe. Absolutely, and it may. I mean, in the end, like, sure, I'll find out eventually, like, in the end of times, or whatever, up in heaven. Right. Sure, everybody's going to figure that out, or maybe, I don't know. But the thing is, it provides, it gives me a better idea of how the world works, Mm -hmm. because there's, as we've already said, there's a spiritual world. Absolutely. And then there's this world. Yep. And it was broken. And it affects, and the spiritual world directly affects the physical. Yeah. Through many different ways, and the... Studying Genesis 6 in the book of Enoch and this kind of stuff brings a a better understanding of how principalities, Satan, interact with the world and how they um, operate. So there's a book called The Art of a War by Sun Tzu. Okay. A little classic. Oh my gosh. You need to read it. (laughs) I've read it. Uh, It's it's amazing. So Mm -hmm. Sun Tzu is described, he was a great, a great warrior general and he, there's a lot of like one-liners in this book, and one of them is the number one way to win a battle is to get your opponent to think the enemy doesn't exist. Mm. And this is the very nature of Satan, the enemy, the demonic, the Nephilim, the Elohim, whatever you want to call them. Mm. This is the nature is that they don't want you to know the spiritual war around you. And then there's this whole taking captive idea. Sin. The nature of sin is enslavement, right? We read that in John 8, where he takes the captives, he takes you slaves, and the sun sets you free from sin. Mm. So there's this concept of the demonic wanting to enslave you, Jesus wanting to set you free, but if you don't know any of this is going on, the deception is working great, Mm. right? David, you look like you want to say something. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) So there's one other thing you need to need to understand about this. Mm. The concept of the, the demonic and the um, power in which the demonic works in the idea of deception, I think, starts with the simplicity of thoughts. Thoughts and emotions. Okay? You go back to Genesis 4 with Cain became very angry at his brother for the offering Abel gave God. Okay? And then God said, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fell? If you do good, will not you feel good? See? Mm. And so these feelings that Cain feelings. has, has become his identity. Oh, how you Now, David had talked about, um, you had brought up earlier something about we, we've despiritualized things, mm-hmm. right? The nature of the despiritualizing is actually the age of enlightenment. Okay, the age of enlightenment in the 18th century started 19th, uh, early early 19th century, end of 18th century. This uh, uh, the age of enlightenment. Okay, postmodernism. Postmodernism. Yeah. yeah. I don't think the age of enlightenment and I, postmodernism are oh, the same yeah, thing. So uh, age of enlightenment way back. Right? Way back. Way back. Age of enlightenment. 16th century. Yeah. Age of enlightenment yeah. is yeah. where we get like <laughs> is where is basically the ideals that the United States was founded. Yeah. Upon. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. So you're talking about the 1600s postmodernism and plus postmodernism, post-modernism is, is, is more, more modern, new. Yeah. More yeah, yeah. So postmodernism brought in this idea of humanism. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Now humanism is this idea that I am God. Okay. This gets back to Genesis with Babel. It gets back to all these demonic things where man, the nature of Babel was trying to reach God. Nimrod, King Nimrod built the Tower oh, of Babel. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he was an evil guy. If you ever read uh, in Genesis, I can't remember. I think it's seven. He was or eight. a Nimrod. Nim- yeah. <laughs> well, what, uh, does it actually say in Genesis that Nimrod built the Tower of Babel? I don't think it does. Let me let me research it. Let's look that up real quick. <laughs> I'm uh, Everything I know is that it's insinuated he did. I, I here. I, it also doesn't. I also don't recall it ever saying that he was particularly evil, which. You can gather that if you do a little bit of research, yeah. but I don't think it directly says it in the Bible itself. But I could be wrong. Yeah, I, I, it's it's pretty obvious he was evil. Um, anyway, I can look I can look that up. While you look that up, I think it's just um, I think it's also important to remember that while you, it's important to talk about this stuff because it, it, it like you said before, like you don't want to read everything or you want to believe everything you read online or watch a YouTube video or the rabbit holes you go down to. It's very 
tempting to get sucked into that kind of stuff for sure. And I'm not saying that these documentaries are that, but what I am saying is this is information that I was like never, uh, never familiar with growing up right? ever. And then to discover it, I'm like, Oh, this is kind of interesting, but I'm going into it knowing that, Oh, it may not be true. It may not be true. But the more I research this stuff, the more context is being brought to me of how spiritual forces work and what I've seen and how it's connecting in my brain. So that's just why I've kind of dived into the kind of this stuff. Uh, whether it is the truth or not, that's why we're discussing it right now. And I'm, it's very convincing and it's, um, I mean, I believe there's definitely some truth to it for sure. Yeah. So the, that's a good point, Jake. Just so, to provide context absolutely. for people like, no, it's These important. guys are crazy. <laughs> no, it's a, it, read, read the Bible. It's not yeah, read the Bible. Science. Yeah. So Genesis 10, eight, Cush fathered Nimrod. He was the first on the earth to be mighty, a mighty man. Now, mighty man is translated actually like godly or very strong. Like hmm. he was very powerful. Very powerful. Yeah. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it says like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Okay. So, and then it goes on to list all the other tribes and it gets into the Canaanites, the Ammonites, the, uh, oh, the Philistines came from this oh. same bloodline. So this, this is messed up. Well, man. by the way, this is all yeah. from Cain. Yeah. Okay. All yep, yep, this bloodline right. yep. comes from Cain mm -hmm. and Cain's bloodline was pretty much evil mm -hmm. all the way through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Noah, mm -hmm. Noah was the only one found righteous in God's sight. And by the way, yeah, I can get into a whole other sermon on this, but <laughs> Noah, the, the, the Hebrew word for grace mm. is first mentioned in Noah. Huh. Isn't that fascinating? That's really cool. Yeah. Oh. I, 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 I can't. Dang. Give you, it's a whole we'll other study. Yeah, whole yeah. other study. Whole another one. But yeah. the grace of God was on Noah. So yeah, David, mm. it is in the Bible and it does say he was the creator of Babel. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he was a bad guy. He was a bad dude. He was bad. Um, yeah, uh, well, I mean, what I meant to say, what yeah, I meant yeah, to say yeah, yeah, was yeah, that go, go, go. the Bible doesn't explicitly detail his misdeeds. No. It right. says very little about him. Right. That's I, true. It, That's true. That's true. If this is the guy that through him spawned the cultures of the Canaanites and well, the exactly. Philistines, right. there's some family uh, bad family roots. Uh, uh, I so, can imagine that this guy wasn't all so, sunshine, sunshine and roses. Well, let's you know? let's apply this whole. <laughs> But demonic. anyway, we're just getting the Hold on, here. hold on. This whole demonic uh, Genesis 6 mixing of bloodlines thing. Oh, yeah. Okay? So th there's a pattern in Genesis of the evil bloodline and the good bloodline. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. a pattern of this. Okay? Um, and so this, this goes on throughout the entire Bible all the way to Noah where it's like God's like, okay, the bloodlines are so corrupted. Mm -hmm. I need to kill everybody. Yeah. He didn't want to. He had no choice. It was to the point where evil had tried to take over the bloodline. And in my opinion, if you read the prophecy over Eve, Adam and Eve, when they sinned was, uh, you're the woman's seed will crush the head of the serpent and the serpent will bruise his heel. That's a prophecy of Christ coming mm. to take over Satan. Amen. So if you, if you heard that and you're the enemy, you're going to try to destroy yep. every single seed of the woman you can. Mm -hmm. Notice it doesn't say seed of man. It says seed of woman. Women don't have seed. Yeah. Because it was a divinely created being, child mm -hmm. by the Holy Spirit, divinely created Son of oh, God, Jesus Christ. Huh. Okay. There was no man involved in that. Interesting. Interesting. That's why huh. it says seed of the woman. Isn't that interesting? That's really cool. So wow. anyway, wow. I we start talking about genetics manipulation. We start talking in our culture now. I'm talking about yeah. our culture now. Mm -hmm. We're talking about uh, genetic CRISPR. Mm, you start researching. You start re researching gene editing with CRISPR. It, it is getting very much where we're changing the human DNA to the point where we will become something else. And this is concerning because this is what happened in in pre flood era. Yeah, and it is said Jesus said in the days of it will be like the days of Noah Ooh. in the end times. So all of these things to me, I'm looking at the Bible. I'm looking at what the Bible says. I'm looking at our culture. I'm looking at deception. I'm looking at deceit. And I'm wondering what is going, like, where are we headed? Where are we headed? Yeah. And what are we deceived by? Mm. You know, you start yeah. really looking at this and how much more important it is that I understand there's a spiritual battle, kind of like you talked about. This is important to know. Mm -hmm. So you can get your heart, mind, and spirit ready to go mm. that you are right with Jesus Christ in your life. Because that's what's going to matter. 
when the ge- goats and the sheep time comes. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So anyway. It, it's cool because like y- you gotta, it's, it's like you just said, like you have to be aware of this kind of thing because you're heading, like we've always been in, I don't know. I've ever, all my life I've always been, we've been heard like, Oh, we're in the end times, you know, but I believe it. Like we are definitely seeing it and to see how it correlates with the physical world, with what can happen in the spiritual. Right. And knowing that the spirit prince, uh, the princes and principalities back in the day of Noah are Correct me if I'm wrong, but after the flood, they were still on the earth because they were spirits without bodies, right? Well, that, that, that's the Enoch uh, uh, description. Oh, that's the Enoch description. Well, oh. yeah, because well, I was ne- just I was just guessing just by yeah. So the the Enoch description of what happened with the demons is that the 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 Nephilim, the giants, yeah, which you know the Bible describes as giants later mm-hmm. on, yeah, um, that, that when they died, their spirits lived on on the earth somewhere, huh? Seeking okay. a home. Ooh. And and that's where that's one of the reasons why they believe the giants may have survived the flood is because mm. of that and the whole idea of the watchers coming back. But it's all Enoch, you know. Uh, there's take also, a grain of salt. There's also the idea too that the uh, the flood wiped out the Nephilim and their spirits are the demons that roam the earth. Yeah, that's what. Yeah, even right. today, that's what I was trying to explain. Yeah, and for the audience out there, I think it's also important to know that they have found bones of literal giants recently. throughout the earth and recently. Recently, as well. just yeah, a couple of years ago, they couple found years ago, a cave from the yep, 1800s cave. that was sealed. Also in Catalina Island, it was in Nevada. The one, uh, I was the, talking Nev- about. the one you're talking about is Nevada. Yeah, there's also they found in Catalina cave. Island as well, uh, off the coast of you know south of California, all that kind of stuff. So like, there's been proof, and there's other places you can also find like um i can't remember that documentary on netflix with that one guy who's kind of like he's an atheist but he kind of studies the flood and that kind of thing Mm. i can't remember what it's called but it's fascinating because he sees like all these fallen civilizations okay and how they were all basically destroyed by a flood oh you're talking about graham Um, uh, graham Graham hancock graham hancock so that just and a lot of people call the guy a fluke or whatever. No, for sure. But he, his heart, I think, is in the right place because he is try, searching this stuff out and trying to dis- learn about it. Like, okay, well, why is there this correlation about it? Why there's been there's proof. Like, and there's very, um, there's lots of conclusions you can pull from these fallen civilizations. There's one that was in Egypt or mm-hmm. south of Egypt in North Africa mm-hmm. where. It, it's just gone. Mm-hmm. It's just completely eradicated from the the land, yep. and you're like, what, "What?" And there's proof of it being there. Stuff like in the Philippines and the oceans, like mm-hmm. of the fallen sea level, there are steps. There the are, road. The th- road. There's roads that yeah, go yeah, yeah, down yeah, yeah. into the water. Right. It's like the Bimini what? Road. The yeah, Bimini yeah. Road. It's like, what's going on here? Right. Like, it makes you ask questions and it makes you curious. So I, w- I would say, Jake, there's more than enough evidence to there's prove that enough. a flood, a worldwide flood, existed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a new documentary called "The Ark in the Darkness." It just came out a month ago, and we went to the theaters to watch it. And it's fascinating. Now they're they're pre you know they're young Earth creationists, but it's just yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah. I but, don't have a I don't have a bone in that fight. Um, but it's fascinating to see the the facts. Yeah, that the DNA in dinosaur fossils are still alive. They've discovered this. There's still tissue on some of the dinosaur bones, like remains they found in ice. And and it's like oh. and they predated it to thousands of years, which is fascinating. So there's oh. all kinds of evidence coming out right now. Yeah, but yeah. this gets back to deception. It gets back to deception. Yeah. Then why isn't this br- you know blasted from the rooftops on all media mm-hmm. sources? Mm-hmm. Why? Because something doesn't want people to believe the Bible is true. Mm-hmm. Well, it's also <laughs> yeah. Well, I agree. Also, you got to remember discernment and of where your um of where your heart's at. Yeah. And when you're looking stuff up like this, like just make sure to ask questions as well. Absolutely. You know? <laughs> oh, this is the idea of free thinking we talked about yeah. with the cult analogy. Yeah. It's like always think for yourself. And yep. here's the greatest thing that can help you do your own research. That's right. Mm-hmm. Do not rely on one source. Get multiple sources to come to a conclusion. Yeah. This is really, really important. Even Michael Heiser's got great stuff, but I like to look at all kinds of points of view mm-hmm. for me to come to a conclusion with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. And it seemed, and it's cool because there's that desire of truth out there from whether it be Christian or atheist or young creationist or secularism in a way. There are people who are hungry for it. Right. And as we get closer to the end, more is being revealed. But I think that shows you that we are in the end times. Absolutely. That more yeah. is being revealed. And you know, it's interesting too. All this discussion really highlights the fact that 
the all this stuff that happened in the book of Genesis is really important for where we're going now. Um, I I just thought about a coworker of mine. I was talking with her about the Bible, and her objection to it was that, well, I I don't want to believe in a bunch of old stories. Mm. And it's like that's that's the deception that's been put out there. That it's just a bunch of old stories. Mm. But then when you start to do digging, you're like, um, this isn't just a bunch of old old wives' tables. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, like you we have the archaeological evidence coming out, and you have just the fact that literally every ancient culture has a flood myth. Yep. Right, exactly. All of them. Yep. All of them. Without exception. Yep. Um and that's extremely significant. <laughs> it's not a coincidence. <laughs> and then when you look at what the Bible details about what was going on in the era and you compare it with today, it's like, there's not just old stories. It's supremely important stuff that we need to know. You know, David, what's fascinating is there's a lot of people that know what Revelation says too. And I have a lot of people that have come to me and been like, hey, I think time's short. I want to get my heart right. I'm like, whoa. Wow, like, dang. yeah. Talk about ripe fruit. Yeah. Talk about people paying attention. And by the way, I mm. think that's the Holy Spirit opening yep. the curtains of deception away. Mm. And I think you're going to see more of that. Mm. The question is, are we ready to receive it? And are we ready to be those witnesses to guide them that way? The harvest is plentiful, mm. but the workers are few. That's right. See, there has to be people ready to receive people and disciple them. And that's the number one thing lacking in the church is discipleship. Mm -hmm. You know, it is one-on-one, reading the Bible together, line by line, just talking about it and growing. And it's not rocket science, you know, but yet we we don't even think about it. We talk about people converting or coming to the Lord. We don't think about, man, they need to build their spirit up. They need to know the Bible. Mm -hmm. You know, it's important because deception is growing. Yeah. But I believe the Holy Spirit is being poured out more. Mm. So I believe at the same time you have the dark getting darker, the light getting lighter. And the question is, where do we stand between those two mm. parallels? You know, are we somewhere in the middle or are we sold out to Jesus, the light? Mm. He is the light. Yeah. And this is the, oh man, Christians need to just wake up. Yeah. You know, that's a pastor it, in me. It, <laughs> you have to, it, it's important to, to, to learn about this stuff because it's like, this is the battle we're facing. It's not against flesh and blood. No, no. Ephesians 6. Mm-hmm. It's not flesh and blood, principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this age, mm-hmm. which by the way, I believe that's Genesis 6 right there. Ooh. That's what I think. Mm. The rulers of the darkness of this age, they were entities. They were entities. Yeah. We can get into more of that Genesis we can get more 6 that, stuff because yeah, there's but, whole like, yeah. there's there's Psalms, uh, is it 80? It's oh 80, yeah, it's like Psalms 80, 82, 82 talks 82, about yeah, yeah. God chaining the principalities <laughs> Yeah. Until the final ju- white throne judgment. And That's fascinating. It's like, wait, what? Wait, there's other principalities that have already been chained waiting yeah, and for they're, judgment. Yeah, and they're waiting. And yeah. we don't get, they aren't here now. You and know what Revelation I mean? Revelation talks about, oh, there's plenty of examples of Revelation that could cor- could correlate with that. Right. It's fascinating. Plenty of them. Well, the white, the white throne judgment is different than other than Jesus returning or other judgments. No, 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 yeah, yeah. I'm the talk- white, white throne judgment is like the final, final. And oh, actually, okay, it's yeah. for him to pull people out of hell. To, mm. to read the and the word is read verdict, I believe, is the translation in Greek. Mm. It's fat. You need to re- research the white throne judgment. It's fascinating up, yeah. in Revelation. Fascinating. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, I digress. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we've covered pretty much everything. Thad. Yeah, the fire hose yeah. is pretty much depleted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you got a drink. But I, I think it is important. Let's let's go back to that last question you have here. It says, what are some deceptions that you think are coming to the culture in Ooh, the future? Like new ones. And we'll end on that. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a good one. Uh, I hate to be this guy. <laughs> Why? <laughs> the whole alien thing. <laughs> He's a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> <laughs> no, listen. Like, here, here's my deal. Mm. If... if <laughs> The nature of deception is that you don't know you're deceived. Well, I've been deceived enough in my life and had the curtain pulled away enough to not trust everything I hear. And the more I hear the acceptance of the alien thing, the less I trust it. Mm. And the more I feel like it's a distraction Mm. from something worse. 
and you want to get back to Genesis 6 again. <laughs> we can. I'm just saying, <laughs> I feel like whatever is about to be revealed, it is a greater deception than mm. even the deceptions we've seen. I would I agree with you on that because when you look at just politically when these documents of UAPs and UFOs have been released, it's been on the exact same day as a major political p- bill being passed or mm. or, or, a, a, or a law enacted or a funding that was passed or something in Congress. Every single, especially in the last year or five years even, every single one of the UFOs has been revealed, every like hearing on them or from fighter pilots or what it be has been has been timed interestingly Correct. i would say yeah it's not by accident it's not by accident well the, the whole idea and is- there's info that is held for a specific reason but it's like oh well let's just it seems like the government has the info and they're like let's just grab it and put it out there and give a little snippet and maybe twist it in a way but pre- preparing Prepare, acclimating us uh, yeah. spoon feeding us something to prepare us for something yeah, greater something i don't know but it's yeah. uh, it what well, what bothers me about it is the willingness to give up the information. Yeah, it's Because I've never seen anything, especially classified things, mm-hmm. willingly given up. Yeah. You know? It's weird, man. Yeah, it, no, it's not weird. It's, mm-hmm. it's not by accident. And mm-hmm. that's why I think I have trust issues there. David, what do you, what do you think? Well, I don't know. I, I'm always skeptical yeah. when it comes to... Everything basically, <laughs> <laughs> and I so I can't say I can't say that I've really um, looked too deeply into this alien thing. Okay, so I don't know much about it, but I think part of the reason why it, the information's coming out now is people have been hounding the government for years and years and years. That's true to release this information because there is a, there are laws in place. Uh, to get information mm-hmm. yep. out of the government. That's right. Yep. And it's called the uh, Freedom of Freedom Information, Information Act. Act. Right, right. So, and of course, the government always drags its feet on stuff. But I, <laughs> I think part of the reason why this is all coming out now is b- people have been hounding mm-hmm. the U.S. government for years and mm. years is we know you have documents and information on this stuff. Release it to mm. us. And also, there's been plenty of information for, uh, information requests about, like, specifically the Kennedy files. Yep. And like they you said, release they them. didn't release them. <laughs> they locked <laughs> so them for another aliens. 40 years. It's like, yeah. it's like, it's interesting to think about what they don't want the public to know. But I think there's, I think there's more nuance to it. I think there's many reasons why they won't reveal things. Um, but I do think that there's nefarious motives. Motives, for well, sure. That's a nature. That, that's where are you bringing the spiritual side to yep. it? There is something that yep. is deceiving about it, mm. and that's what I. That's what you have to understand. It's not just men being men. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's spiritual influence. There's something. Too. Yeah. So you have to take all There's that. There's more to it. You have to take all that into account when you. There's calculate more to the formula. it than whatever Congress or political person you're following. There's more to it oh, than yeah. just that one person. There's more to it than all of it. There's that's more why you need the Holy Spirit to guide you in it. Mm. So one quick thing, and then yeah. I want David to share what deceptions he thinks mm. are coming. Uh, one is the Imago Dei, which is Latin for the image of God, is under attack. It's been under attack for years. And it's coming to a head where um, humans, if, you're, if you are a human being, you carry the image of God automatically. Okay, It's a common grace you have about you, um, which is a theological term for a gift from God that you didn't earn. So it's this, even if you don't know the Lord, and it's it's this idea that you were not created perfect. You were not created right. God made a mistake. Therefore, humans need to change you into something else. Okay? This is the Imago Dei. The image of God is being distorted. Okay? And there's a lot of push for that. There's been a ton of push, and it's amplified tenfold, especially the last five years. Mm. And so I feel like now that the image of God is being corrupted, the more we corrupt that, now let's introduce something else, else. to replace the image of God. And that's my concern. That's why I said CRISPR and gene editing is very concerning to me because it's almost the logical next step in deception. And then it's like buy into it. And if you don't buy into it, you're the odd one out. And maybe you won't even be able to buy and sell if you don't buy into it. You know, there's a lot of ideas you can go with it. I'm not yeah, saying yeah, that's yeah. true, but no, I get you. It's concerning. It's, it's concerning. things yeah. I think about. It's it's I wonder, yeah. you know, I I um I ask the Lord about it all the time. But the number one thing is do you know Jesus Christ? And are you being led by the Holy Spirit? Mm -hmm. And that's the bottom line, no matter how dark it gets. All right, David, go. Um, So, yeah, deception. Um, I mean, 
who's who's to know what sort of sick and twisted things people are going to come up with next. But I feel like the trend is now um, finding ways to ignore the truth of who you are mm. and craft a new identity for yourself that is not only in opposition to God's will, but flies in the face of all reason right. and logic and science. Right. Um, you see that with the, I mean, I think I'm going to get canceled <laughs> for saying this. I got picketers outside waiting. But you <laughs> see it. this get You see torches. this with the, the whole idea of being <laughs> transgender. Right. Like the idea that you could be a man born in a woman's body or a woman born in a man's body is flies in the face of just basic reason. Right. Like, and yet, people have picked up this idea and said, no, 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 I, away with all that nonsense about biology, mm. and I'm going to pick this up instead, and this is going to be my identity because I say it is. So I think what's coming down the line is just more of that and more blatant and even worse ways. Can, can I add, the reason why it's so blatant and so... Um, egregious to challenge it is because it is a religion. It has become a religion. Mm. And people believe in it to the point where my feelings depict who I am. The very nature of Cain himself. Yeah. I am angry, therefore I will kill you. I have the right to. It's the same idea. I am not whoever. I'm not a man. I'm not a woman. I'm not, I feel attracted to this you know, gender or whatever. Therefore, I'm going to change everything about me and defy the Imago Dei. It's, it's, it, in my opinion, it is a religion because of the way it is defended. Mm. Very cult-like. Anyway, that's a good one, David. Well done. I, I don't cancel you. <laughs> you are not canceled. I think of the, the times throughout history, people have kind of looked at the book of Revelation in their time. And I think of like during Julius Caesar. No, not Julius Caesar. That was, that was later. Um, let's see what's a good example but like um but like the church of england during that time during genghis khan during the world war ii mm. during all during the civil war in the u.s during all these things that are happening throughout history and they're like the end's coming near the end's coming near and and how they can picture it happening in their time and i think of that and i think of the correlation of the antichrist mm. and of what what we know is coming and what shape it will be and I don't know if it'll be in our lifetime, but I think we're definitely in the end times. However, what I will say is, I think what you hit is, on the head is perfect, YouTube, is um, identity and the struggle of, because we'll have a, like, you know, it's kind of cheesy to say, but the God-shaped hole, shaped hole in all of us, because we were made for a specific purpose, is to be with him. Yeah. And to uh, invite him in. And so people will try to replace that and fill that hole with whatever they can, materialism, um, games, movies, whatever, media even. And I think in what we've seen politically in the last 20 years, what we've seen culturally in the last 20 years, has been a strive for replacement. And I'm, I don't know exactly what is going to happen, but I don't think anybody does. <laughs> but... And I just, I think of Revelation and I think of Israel's involvement. I think of the the two prophets being killed in the street. Uh, and I think Babylon, right? Or in the city that is known as Babylon. Um, you can read it in Revelation. But I think of what that what shape that will be and what the correlation it has with technology and machinery and AI and the pit and what that involves. And I don't, and I'm just, and I'm mentioning all these things to not really get a conclusion but to just keep it in mind that to be look, on the lookout for it and what shape it might take. I have one verse. Especially when, you get pe especially when you get people behind the scenes that we know in our country in political spaces around this world that worship the occult. Oh, for sure. And seek out Satan and the principalities. Yeah. And it's proven that they have. Well, and how much more do you think actually is going on? Exactly. If we got a, a tip of the iceberg. So showing, if we think yeah. that, oh, AI is going to be, yeah, it's very concerning. But also think about who's running behind the scenes 
and how it correlates with the revelation. That's all I'll really say. I don't really have a specific example. Uh, I have a verse to actually go with what you're talking about. Okay. Really what all three of us have talked about. This is Psalms 115. It says, why should the nations say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold. The work of human hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. They have eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. They have noses, but they do not smell. They have hands, but do not feel. But do not and uh, feet, but do not walk. And they make and they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. He's talking about the idol worship. The idol worship. Yeah, it's about idol worship. Yeah, they had silver and gold, wood idols. They became numb. They couldn't taste, smell, hear, walk. This is a spiritual state people become when they worship things that are inanimate objects. Now, mm. fast forward that to ideologies. Ooh, okay. okay. An ideology movement, a religion. I follow this ideology. You become what you worship. You become like the thing you idolize. What if you're worshiping yourself? Exactly. Mm. Well, that's what my point the world, the dece- great deception is all the different idols that the world's worshiping. But what I'm seeing is people becoming like the things they worship. We talked about hosts and hosting and that kind of thing and being in, letting things into your heart. And back in the day when they had idols, it's not like, oh, the idols, like if somebody burned your idol or whatever, it's like, oh, they're just probably going to go make a new one and hopefully whatever inhabits the idol will come back. Mm. So with this whole like, <laughs> hate to bring up AI again, but with the the transhumanism aspect of merging yourself with a more capable intelligence, what does that mean for idols and spirits and principalities? Absolutely, gene editing, all of it. Yeah, gene uh, editing, all of and stuff. and you know once once they start creating superhumans. We can do another podcast on Super. Yeah. <laughs> it's gonna be like the boys. Just. <laughs> we'll be in the bunker then, though. Yeah. Right? Oh, <laughs> David, you got the bunker ready. Right? David's been building the bunker. Did you oh, find yeah. the keys last week? Oh, he lost the keys. <laughs> no. Oh. 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 I forgot. <laughs> there goes our apocalypse oh, plan. Oh man. <laughs> uh, is there any final words, guys? Uh, Are you satisfied with this topic? Then? Oh yeah, we went <laughs> way deep. I love it. Uh, I love I love being here with you guys, studying the Bible with you guys. It's fun. It it, turn, it gets me excited and mm-hmm. and uh, opens my eyes spiritually to things. And sometimes when you just talk about ideas with other people, mm-hmm. it helps you f- uh, fl- flesh, flesh it out, out. Yeah. flesh mm-hmm. it out. Mm-hmm. And so it's also um, fun too because like in preparing this, I'm like, oh, that's coming on. I got to do some research, you know, and like dive into just. And, and just get enveloped in the word, which is really right. cool. It's really yeah. refreshing. And the Bible is what it's we really should cool. be going to all the time. Yeah. So that's my yeah. encouragement. Go to but the, the Bible. But the deep dives is what it's really fun, you know? We, cool that, yeah, yeah, I encourage you, please, all yeah. listeners out there, mm-hmm. go deep into the word of God. Study mm-hmm. the original Hebrew and Greek. Yeah. Find definitions. Look at cross-references throughout the rest of scripture. Mm-hmm. This is... This is how you study the word of God. It's yeah. not rocket science, but man, it feeds your soul. Yeah. And there's uh, and there's plenty of value to be had in the New and the Old Testament. Absolutely. I, I kind of strewed to the New Testament because it's like the walk of life and being a Christian and doing what's right. But also, there's so much in the Old Testament. Like, Gotta go to the roots. Start with Joshua, at least, yeah. or even Genesis. Just start Genesis from the beginning and go great. through it. Like David said. And it, it, it's powerful stuff, man. Yeah. Mm. Get in the word. Get in the word. Mm. David, how about you? Get in the word. Get, Get in, in the, the word. word. Yep. We need a shirt. <laughs> Get in the word. To a whole nother level. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to us uh, and taking your valuable time to listen to us three beardy bros. We really appreciate you, and uh, we uh, just want to thank you, and uh, we hope you have a, just a wonderful day. Yeah, so, be blessed. Be blessed. So, And snarp fangle on. Yeah. Bye-bye now. <laughs>